Good morning, good morning. I want to welcome everybody to the uh, ad hoc committee on the 2028 games. If you please take your seats. I'm joined today by members uh, Krikorian, O'Farrell, and Price. So we do have a quorum. Mr. Clerk, you want to let us know what we're talking about today? Mr. the City Clerk, item one is a CAO and CLA joint report relative to the LA 2028 annual report for 2019 and the LA 2028 independent budget assessment report conducted by KPMG. Okay, you know what, what we should do? I'm going to hear from the public quickly, so I'm going to call Arnold Sachs, Johnny Coleman, and Eric Sheehan. Please come forward, sergeants, if you would remove the rope. Public comment, come on, everybody gets a minute. Yes, thank you. Good morning, Arnold Ross Sachs. Uh, this seems to be the LA 2028 annual report for 2019 and the LA 20, 2028 independent budget assessment report, which is being done by the KMPG audit and financial advisor. Don't you find it weird that your financial advisor is doing the auditing of the financial reports? It's like putting all your eggs, it's like leaving the hen house open for the foxes with direction signs on how to steal the money. Uh, I think you ought to separate your financial reports from your audit. Uh, as an example, Mr. Galpin did a, an audit of the DWP and decided that there was no crimes committed, but they were spending money illegally. It's not his job to decide. That's the problem when the word and. It's inclusive and it's and it's okay thank you next speaker identify yourself hi my name is Johnny with DSA LA and Olympics LA um, so apparently we're talking about the budget today right hi Mitch we're over here we're having a conversation over here um, so it's it's no surprise that behind this red velvet rope is where we have all the money people here like mr. Wasserman whom if we're gonna be talking about youth sports, let's talk about Casey's record with people like Jeffrey Epstein and their relationship to children. Is that someone who we really want in control let's of stay our youth on sports? That topic. Is, is the topic no, let's the stay budget? On, let's stay on topic. What's the topic, the budget? Do you wanna speak or do you wanna debate me? Because we can stop this right now. So stay on topic. The budget? Next speaker. Yes, sir. Identify yourself. Yeah, hi, Eric Sheehan, Olympics LA. Uh, in nine years, who of you will still be in office? Uh, who of you will be held accountable when the Olympics invariably goes uh, massively over budget? Uh, who of you will be held accountable when ICE deports or cages members of our communities? Who of you will be around when 2028 comes and tents and encampments are still a common sight because they're the new normal? In 2028, will the city still think criminalizing and finding those experiencing homelessness will somehow help them find housing and live dignified lives. We all agree we don't want to see people sleeping in tents on the street, but the path we're on now won't even come close to addressing the, this crisis. The Olympics will tie our hands and walk back any gains we've made from the wholly insufficient execution of HHH. Building transitional shelters is good, but if they're patrolled inside and out by police, I can't imagine they'll do more good than harm. Instead of wasting taxpayer money on developer handouts for the supposed hotel crisis, please build, buy, expropriate market housing, and make it cheap, Roll back the last 10 years of rent increases, undo the harm done by speculation and billionaire developers at the expense of low-income communities. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Previn, you're right there. You can come up, and then I'll get Jed Perriott and Adam Smith, Molly Lampert. Mr. Uh, identify yourself. Sure. It's Eric Previn from Studio City. Thank you, sir. I just uh, was reminded that the, you know, we've done a lot of work with AECOM. They're doing a great job. There's a lot of outfits that get breaks, they've got a hotel deal coming up on transit occupancy tax. I know the, the whole LA Live, they got a major just recently, just before Englander popped out. The question is with Airbnb, we're coming after the small folks for that transit occupancy tax. But the question is, you know, if we give, if we're driving all this business for the Olympics, which I think is a, you know, civic measure of civic pride, but the feeling that it's going to be distributed to the real folks is 
there's a little worry there, and I think that people are onto the idea that the 160 million is going to go to the Parks and Rec Department, who are going to staff up and take that money to provide the service that they've continued to provide, but with a little more emphasis, and we're looking forward to that. Swimming is great. But, sir, you got to find a way to level the playing field and make it so that, I don't know if that these infrastructure projects are going to really address the fact that so many people can't live in town, have to travel in from San Bernardino. So I just worry it's just going to be a tourism generator. And tourism is terrific for David Rue and some of the folks, but for the Thank regular you. people, thanks. Thank you, Mr. Previn. Next, and I'll be looking for Ann Orchier, uh, Audrey George. Yes, identify yourself. Hi, Jed Perry with the DSA and No Olympics LA. Uh, it's a disturbing trend that we're seeing here, the upward trend of the budget for these games. Seven billion now, seven billion. And I don't care what Casey Wasserman says about, oh, it's privately funded. Right now in this city, all funding should be going to housing, public housing, permanent housing for those who are living in the streets right now. It is absolutely disgraceful that you are all talking about how we need hotels in this city. How we need hotels, how hotel construction is trending upward. Meanwhile, and by the way, no one voted for the Olympics. No one here voted to have the Olympic Games. You know what they did vote for? They voted for Triple H, which is trending downward. Triple H, Eric Garcetti proudly said 7,000 units at his State of the City address. I thought it was supposed to be 10,000, council members. Why is that number going down? Hotels going up? And you know what? You do something about it. You tax people like Casey Wasserman. You tax billionaires. You make them build more public housing because people are dying right now. And you have blood on your hands. Thank you, sir. We've been joined by Mr. Gilbert Cedillo. Next speaker, please. Come identify yourself. Good to see you and your children. Hi, my name is Adam Smith. I'm an organizer with White People for Black Lives and a, and a proud member of the No Olympics Coalition. Um, I've got a lot of concerns about the Olympics. Um, the LAPD mentioned that they want to put 2,500 more police on the streets um, before 2028, specifically for security for um, a two-week event. And I'm really concerned at, at what 2,500 more cops means to um, neighborhoods that are already over-policed. And what's really concerning is this $7 billion budget doesn't once mention the LAPD. So this 2,500 2, more police, which is 25% of the current police force, so we're talking about you know, five, another $500, $750 million coming out of the general fund for the police in the next nine years. Um, Casey Wasserman's buddy Garcetti talks about solving homelessness by 2028. How is that happening with, with more police? We see... Thanks. I got another minute, right? No, nope. thank you. Oh. Minute each. All right. Next speaker, please. Hi, my name's Molly Lambert. I grew up in the Valley. Um, I went to Harvard Westlake with kids like Casey Wasserman and Eric Garcetti, so I know that they don't live in the real Los Angeles and they don't care what really happens in the city or about the people who really live in the city, the poor people, the unhoused people. 918 people died on the streets of Los Angeles this year from being unhoused. Spending $9 billion on an Olympics that we don't need to cater to tourists who we don't need, we already have great tourism, uh, is insane. It's psychotic. So I hope your Olympics fails. We're going to make sure it doesn't happen in Los Angeles and nowhere else in the world. Uh, good luck. Thank you. Next speaker, identify yourself. Audrey George with White People for Black Lives and here to speak for uh, the No Olympics Coalition. Once again, almost $7 billion. Council member, I, I shudder to think about how this city is going to spruce itself up to create the illusion that LA has no poverty, no homelessness, no crime, no racism. Think about what those steps are going to mean for impacted communities. They're going to, there's going to be displacement and increased police militarization. And once those things happen, they are never undone. The harm is never undone. We are empowered by knowing from the jail fight that we did with the Board of Supervisors. It is possible to stop a moving train, and we will stop this one. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, my name is Anne Orchier. I'm also with No Olympics LA. Um, you all probably aren't aware of this because um, 
you know, unlike uh, the LA 2028 organizing committee, we speak to a lot of people in actual communities that are going to be affected by the Olympics. We know that they have not responded or have turned down invitations to speak with a lot of the communities and groups that we talk to. People are furious about this budget. And um, I also hope you know that every time you justify it by saying it's privately funded, all we hear, and by we, I mean your constituents, I mean the people who are struggling to pay rent and stay in this city, the people who are terrified of the police, all we hear is that this money exists and it's not going to the things that we need. It does, only accountants care about the fact that it's privately funded. We just hear that number and we hear that's $7 billion that exists that could go to housing, that could go to schools, that could go to any type of services that we're constantly being told there's not enough for. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay, Mr. Clerk, that concludes public comment. Um, why don't we bring uh, the folk up to the center table and begin our conversation. So. We've been joined by Mr. Bob Blumenfield. Okay, so Mr. Wasserman, I think what we'll do, we'll just have you guys start, and then uh, we'll uh, ask if the members have questions for you. Great. Thank you, uh, Council President and uh, Ad Hoc Committee. It's nice to be in front of you again. Um, I think it's always important to remember what our mission is for the 2020 Olympics and why we're here, and that's truly to deliver an amazing games for the city of Los Angeles. Uh, LA has an uh, unbridled spirit of optimism and youthful energy, and we're going to harness all the creativity and innovation and excitement in Los Angeles to deliver a truly memorable Olympic Games and Paralympic Games in 2028. These games are low risk because LA is ready to host the games today. Uh, we are building zero permanent new venues, zero, which is uh, unprecedented in the hosting of Olympic Games. We have no infrastructure requirements. Uh, we have no incremental spending for the city. Uh, we are prepared for the games as the city exists today, full stop. And we are looking forward to 2028 being a truly proud moment for the city. Uh, to look back at the year in review in 2018, uh, we really focused on two things. Uh, one, we wanted to uh, uh, lay the foundation for an organizing committee that could deliver on the plan uh, that we have both bid on and delivered to you. Uh, that's an organization that's built to drive revenue. Uh, in a city where our costs are very predictable, uh, given the fact that we don't have to build venues, our opportunity is to maximize revenue. Uh, and so we have completed our joint marketing agreement with the USOC, and we have hired a world-class team of executives led by Kathy Carter to go uh, facilitate the, the delivery of the revenue uh, in our plan. And the second piece is we updated our games budget uh, as we agreed to with you for 2028. Um, the, the, the focus of that was the venues did not change. Our plan for 2024 is our plan for 2028 with no exceptions. Uh, the two additions to that are four more years of operating as well as $160 million for the youth sports program that we committed to the city. Uh, that budget was submitted to KPMG uh, for review. Uh, that review has been done and you have that uh, analysis um, um, at yours. Uh, and for 2019, um, we are focused on two things. Uh, executing that commercial plan uh, that starts with sponsorship revenue, uh, that will go down the line from there, but we are actively in the marketplace uh, and having great success to begin with. And the second thing is uh, delivering on the youth sports program, which was always intended to start uh, in the fall of 2019. And we've had great conversations uh, with Rec and Parks. Uh, and your council district offices about how to execute that plan, but our money is ready to go and to make sure that access to youth sports uh, is not determined on the zip code you live in. And so we're excited about both those things and looking forward to uh, continuing ahead. Thank you. Okay. You want to walk us through your analysis? Sure, of course. Um, so uh, first, I want to thank the city and LA28 for their cooperation throughout the budget review. It's not an easy process, uh, and we know that. Um, so our budget review started with a comparison back to the budget we reviewed in 2016 compared to the budget dated January 22nd of this year to identify the areas of the budget that changed, so the focus areas that we would dive into. 
the way that we looked at those changes was the same. Detailed procedures around testing the assumptions that were used, the models that were used, any backup and supporting information that substantiated the estimates. So as you can imagine, a main focus for us was the inflation. Could you pull the microphone oh, a little closer? Yeah. Eighty-six percent of the changes in the budget relate to inflation. So we dived into the inflation methodology that was used, the specialist reports that were um, procured by and the consultants that were used by LA28, and we found no issues and we found the, uh, the inflation methodology to be reasonable. We additionally looked at how cash flow would be um, estimated throughout the next several years. So we looked at the timing of inflows of cash and the timing of outflows of cash. And we felt that given the timeline, it was a reasonable, um, it was a reasonable cash flow methodology. We also dived into areas of the budget that changed outside of inflation and went through the assumptions, the support, and uh, any materials to substantiate those estimates. And we were comfortable with those as well. And those are laid out in detail in our report. Um, and lastly, what we did is we took the host city contract and validated that anything that was in there that should be represented in the budget, including the contingency, the financial guarantees, and all of those aspects were appropriately reflected. So overall, our conclusion is the budget is complete and reasonable. We do recommend that LA28 continue to adhere to the assumptions and estimates at this stage of the games, um, given that the games are nine years in the future, and continue to implement the budget governance and control steps that we have seen them taking place uh, as we saw in this review. Okay, now you indicated that, I can't remember the figure, 80 six percent of the increase mm -hmm. was due to inflation Correct. what are the other factors so the other factors are the aspects so the youth both uh, the youth sports program is included there's also changes as it relates to ticketing because there's increased time to allow for increased sales of ticketing there's also um, given that the ocog is going to be operating for longer there are changes to the staffing plan as you would imagine as well so we dived into that and there's also changes in the sponsorship uh, domestic sponsorship which we looked at that as well those were the key changes. Okay, uh, Casey, I know there's, or there's talk of concerns where it relates to security and the cost. Can, can you talk about that? Yep, so um, uh, from the federal government, we've got the assurance that uh, this will be designated just as the 2002 Olympics were a national special security event. Uh, so that's an ongoing conversation uh, with the various partners at both the federal and the state level. Um, obviously, Congress uh, will appropriate the funds. That doesn't happen until we get much closer, uh, but we have every belief that just as in 2002, uh, as a national special security event, uh, the federal government will be responsible for the coordination and delivery of the security operation. Okay, well, I have two last questions, and then I'll open it up for the rest of the uh, members. I know that the you're negotiating with us, so what's left with our negotiations? So we're operating uh, the games agreement, which is really two things. Uh, it's, it's the core MOU, which will be unchanged from our previous agreement, uh, and it will add two things to it. One, uh, the particulars around the funding of the youth sports program, and secondly, uh, very simply, just the cater categorization of enhanced services delivered by the city, which is entirely already accounted for in our budget financially, but it's just the categorization of those of those numbers, and those will be uh, a part of the games agreement, which we believe is on track for uh, the fall. Okay, so I know we might have some financial and policy concerns where it relates to our relationship with the other municipalities. How's that going? Uh, our games agreement will set the standard for the way we work with every other city, so every city will have the same clause and expectations of delivery of enhanced services uh, as the city, but the city of LA will be the one to set the standard and set the bar that all other cities will live up to. Okay. Members? Mr. Blumenfield? Thank you. Uh, it's great that we don't have to build anything. Uh, you know, that's, that is, takes away a lot of our risk. On, on the flip side, will we be left with any, any legacy from the games in terms of infrastructure? when it's all said and done? Uh, look, our, our belief is that the legacy will come from the youth sports programs and, uh, and our goal of, of delivering a surplus to the games that will deliver the programs that will benefit the city, just like LA 84 has done from the 84 games. Uh, we're using half a dozen venues from 1932. <laughs> we will obviously use some venues from 84, um, but in a world where we don't have to build those venues, um, the legacy we think will be much more about the impact it has on people's lives than it will be about the facilities that we, we frankly don't, don't build because of the games. 
Great, and, and the 160 million is fantastic and it will benefit kids now and well into the future. Uh, how is it going, that money is going through Reckon Parks, is that, is that correct? And, and I know you're meeting regularly, are we all on the same page of how that's gonna function? Uh, we are, our primary delivery partner is Rex and Park. Uh, we have uh, um, had great conversations and engagement with uh, the entire staff. Uh, and our plan is that $160 million is to uh, subsidize participation for youth and Rex and Park's responsibility is, is sort of their responsibility on a daily basis, which is to deliver safe uh, environments for kids to participate in great programs. But our opportunity with the $160 million is to broaden the access to any and all kids who want to participate in youth sports programs so that money isn't a barrier to entry. Great. And the last question, you mentioned the security with the feds. Um, also interested in terms of if anything has changed with, with the state. I mean, security is so important for, for all of us. I, I remember the 96 games. I was at right where the bomb went off literally 10 minutes before it went off and, and sort of know firsthand what, what, what can happen and it can only be worse here. And, and I know we've got the feds, we've got our own program, and what about the state and their, their obligations? So the state is engaged uh, and we're in the process of, uh, of setting up a state entity to start to coordinate security operations. Obviously, um, it would be inappropriate to get too far ahead of planning for an event nine years in the future in terms of, uh, of, of uh, distracting the security organizations that will be involved, uh, but it is an ongoing conversation that we have and, and all the partners have been uh, quite active in that participation. Great, thank you very much. Okay, uh, Mr. O'Farrell. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you for this uh, report. Um, how often will a budget assessment be done leading up to 2028? Uh, well, f f we have happy to be in front of you as often as you want. We, we have said is we will come to you yearly and pre represent the budget. Obviously, uh, as an organization, <laughs> that's something we do on a daily basis. Uh, we are managing our budget and our cash flows and our, our planning on a daily basis, and we take that seriously as a private organization responsible for delivering it. Right. I, I mean, I would imagine with the, you know, just the, the variables in the economy, it might be um, good to order an assessment as needed in future years leading up to the 2028 games. Do we're, you, we're, more than right. we're more than happy to do that. It's mm -hmm. obviously something we're doing, as I said, uh, daily. Yeah, this is great. Um, and then a completely sort of different question and just a, a thought and an opinion. I am actually hopeful that we can build a permanent whitewater rafting course. Uh, and. I would love to take a look at what the funding for that would be, where they've been built permanently in two other American cities. There, and these are Olympic caliber certified whitewater rafting courses. They're really a big draw for visitors and locals uh, to en enjoy. So I, I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Uh, I know we had, the plan is to build a temporary one, uh, but a, a permanent one would be a permanent lasting I think, um, sort of legacy uh, for the 2028 Olympics. Yeah, our current plan uh, is a temporary facility uh, in the Sepulveda Basin as part of mm -hmm. our Valley Sports Park. Um, but obviously we're happy to have the conversation. We are always in those conversations with the international federations about delivery of venues, costs, revenue opportunities, and, and our job is to balance those things to deliver the best results. So, uh, but the other facilities are really remarkable. I mean, what Oklahoma right. City has done is really special and, and we understand that whether it's whitewater rafting or others, there are really unique opportunities to deliver venues that could leave a lasting legacy. So you'd be open to that? We're, we're, we are open. Um, look, our, our plan is to make sure that we do this responsibly and mm -hmm. in the context of that, we're open to any and all ideas. Terrific, thank you. Mr. Kerkorian. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, got a few questions, I think, first for KPMG. Um, the bulk of the uh, change in the budget, as the President mentioned, was uh, due to inflation. But different inflation calculations were applied to revenues and expenses. Uh, can you talk about the methodology for how inflation was calculated that came to different totals for those amounts? Yeah. It's actually the same inflation calculation. It's the same percentage applied equally across, but there are certain line items or certain aspects that are not impacted by inflation. Specifically, the difference between revenue and expenses is the amounts received by the IOC are fixed. They're not impacted by inflation. So that's the main difference. So when you see that difference in the, the, that table. I, I'm 
not sure how that works. The expense number is still 350 million higher than the uh, revenue number after adjustment. How, if, if the, the is wouldn't the IOC contribution be on the expense side? Sorry, you can. I was just going to add yeah. sort of the IOC revenue contribution is about 1.5 billion in cash and about 400 million in services, so it's about two billion dollars of our revenue number, so that number is fixed by the IOC. The rest of the numbers were grown at inflation, right. just like the expenses were, in total grown at inflation. Okay. So, so, so that just is, the that's IOC figured number. figured onto the revenue side. Correct. Pardon? That's figured onto the revenue side, which is, because the revenue number comes out lower than the mm -hmm. expense. Correct, okay. but the, the inflation rates were the same. Okay. Um, and uh, in terms of the impact of the new norm of the IOC, um, I understand that that is a commitment to cost reduction that the IOC has made. Um, my concern is, is that um, who's cost reduction, I guess, is because it, it, it isn't really fleshed out what the new norm policies are. If this is a concern about reducing risk to the IOC, that heightens my concern. No, it's a, it's purely a, a cost uh, and a new, a new, the new norm applies directly to organizing committees uh, and so it's cost savings to the del delivery of the game. So reducing the size of venues, reducing the scale uh, of an international broadcast center, more flexibility in venue delivery locations. There's all sorts of uh, things within the new norm um, and, and by the way, as time continues, those things will evolve even further and, and accrue, we believe, much more benefit uh, to the organizing committee, but we took the most conservative approach in this budget that you saw here, which was s simply adjusting from the 2024 to 2028. Great. Now, in terms of uh, ticket sales, uh, there was a finding in the original KPMG audit that the ticket sale assumptions, uh, I forget the terminology, but were not consistent with the guiding principles. Yes, mm -hmm. the guiding yeah. principles. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and in this report, uh, there's an indication that um, the estimates have obviously changed. There's been a change in methodology. Mm -hmm. Can you walk us through how the methodology now is better, I assume, than the methodology that was applied uh, for the previous mm -hmm. budget? So we went back to anything that we identified in the prior report to see how that was addressed going forward. So we did re-review um, the assumptions and the models used to estimate ticketing revenue and the support behind that. So in the LA28 also looked at the popularity of sports and determined ticketing revenue based on that, which is the change from the, the prior time. So that was the difference in the estimation and we were comfortable with that updated methodology. Okay, is that a methodology that um, is consistent with what's been applied in prior games? It is. Okay, mm -hmm. and to what degree of accuracy have those assumptions uh, been found uh, in, pr in prior games? What, in other words, if this is a budgeting assumption about ticket sales, mm -hmm. there's a budgeted assumption and then there's an actual ticket sales. So how has the, this methodology produced a budget assumption that has comported with actual sales in prior games? So we feel that the methodology used for basically basing the ticket sales on the popularity as well is the better practice to go. So that is what we've seen in other games and that's what we would typically look for. So we felt that the updated estimate is, for given where we are, it's the estimate that we feel is most reliable, which is the one that LA28 used. I, I get that, my question's mm -hmm. a little bit different. We now ha we have a track record mm -hmm. of other games that have applied similar assumptions to ticket sales. How close to their assumptions have actual sales uh, come in? And w sort of what's the margin of error, I suppose, in prior games? I would have to get you that type of level of detail. Of I, I would appreciate it if yeah. you could. I mean, it doesn't have to be in great detail. It's just, you know, no. w was the, uh, you know, was the London games 20% off or was it 2% off right. in its ticket sales? It's, it's just, I, I want to get a scale of accuracy yeah. because we're projecting out now four years further into the future. Mm -hmm. So obviously with all of our assumptions, 
there's a higher degree of inaccuracy just mm -hmm. due to the passage of time. So it's harder to predict. So I want to see where we've been, where the Olympics have been in prior games. Um, now, there is a requirement uh, of, uh, for the youth sports programs that they be quality programs. And um, there's some discussion about what constitutes quality programs in here. Um, and Mr. Wasserman, I, it, can you speak to us a little bit about, um, in, in order to achieve the goal of quality programming, um, what are your thoughts about the current state of programming in recreation and parks and what would need still to be done to qualify as quality programming? And I say that in the context not just of that we want to do this in order to qualify for Olympic sports money, but also because these are things that we want to achieve in our parks for our kids. So, yeah. you know, from your analysis of this, what, what are your thoughts? Well, look, we, we believe that the city has well stated uh, standards for what a quality Rex and Park um, uh, program is, uh, the facilities, the environment, the staffing levels. Uh, and we agree with those completely. Uh, our view has been that the gating factor and the opportunity for uh, meaningful impact is to provide more access to those existing programs than it is for us to change those programs because we believe that they are well designed and well executed and the challenge for the children of this community is that they can't afford access to those programs and our $160 million is entirely focused on providing much more access to existing great programs uh, that exist in the city so um, we're strong proponents of the existing programs and our job is to make sure as many kids have access to those as possible. So all of that money would really be additive to current programs and it would be focused primarily in communities of greatest need? Correct. Okay. Um, and then finally, uh, one of the cost elements that resulted in the higher budget was the sustainability program, but I haven't seen anything that really defines what that is. Can you kind of give us an overview of what that um, might well, I think I think to be fair, uh, trying to define what a sustainability program is nine years from now uh, will be a challenge. We think it's a platform that uh, has a great opportunity to attract lots of partners. Um, it's something obviously we're going to invest in meaningfully to the budget, actually not a huge increase percentage-wise, obviously relatively small dollars, but um, we do believe it's an opportunity to make sure that these games have as little uh, uh, environmental impact uh, as possible given the nature of um, the sustainable uh, environment we operate in in, in California and uh, not having to build any venues. So it's an, a program and, and, and a ethos we're going to invest in across the nine years, but ultimately in the delivery we're going to be cautious in how, uh, in how we roll that out to take advantage of every opportunity as we get closer. Great. Thank you. I'm sorry, Mr. President. One no, final no, thing, no, right. um, and this is for KPMG. Um, Given the longer time frame and the inherently greater degree of uncertainty that comes with an additional four years, um, is it your feeling that the 10% contingency built into the budget and the insurance portfolio uh, that we've uh, that that the organizing committee is providing um, are remain appropriate at appropriate levels given the level of risk? Yeah, correct. In comparison to prior games budget, yes. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mr. Price. Hey, see, good to see you. Nice to see you. see you and the team. Uh, <clears throat> and I'm glad that we're moving forward. I understand there have been some uh, discussions, negotiations around broadcast rights with the uh, IOC and uh, I guess our, the U.S. partners. Anything uh, you can share on that? Uh, well, uh, NBC, prior to us being awarded the Games, uh, uh, has the broadcast rights through the 2032 Olympics having nothing to do with us being awarded the game. So in the United States, NBC, uh, as they have been for many years, will be the broadcaster of the 2028 Olympics. Any um, arrangement with, with, uh, with NBC uh, um, that might benefit the we, we've entered into bottom a, line of our games? Uh, we, we've entered into a, a, a significant commercial uh, arrangement with NBC um, where they have uh, made a significant investment uh, in our uh, sponsorship rights, um, which we think gives us great uh, opportunity and visibility and certainty uh, around the delivery of our budget, uh, which will allow us to go to market uh, with both media and sponsorship together, uh, the media rights they controlled, the sponsorship rights we controlled, uh, and as part of that investment, uh, we have um, 
protected our downside significantly. Has that been a typical arrangement in, in the past? No, past that's games? quite quite a unique arrangement and something uh, I, I think uh, we're both very proud of and excited about. I know also the uh, inclusion of uh, small local businesses has been a real, is an ongoing uh, commitment you have. Uh, I know it's still kind of early, but have you done anything along those lines to uh, start uh, um, informing our small, medium-sized firms, especially our local firms, about opportunities that may be, may, that will be coming? It's always been our highest priority that these games uh, positively impact and touch uh, every part of Los Angeles. and. The local and small business community here is sort of the, the, the heart of Los Angeles, and uh, it is a priority for us and our board to make sure that they are positively impacted and have every opportunity to compete and win that business. And obviously, we're not in a place where we're actually <laughs> spending any money on on uh, on uh, those kinds of things now, but it will be a significant part of our delivery of the games, and we're excited about that. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Sadia. Thank you for being here. I just um, want, want to make a comment on this discussion about youth sports and us advancing and I think probably for the first time uh, receiving benefit from the games before the games even happen. I think it's important, uh, at least I'll say for my district, within the last six weeks we've opened up a new 10 acre, most environmentally sound uh, park with soccer fields, baseball fields, basketball courts. We opened up a new gym at the uh, girls local Catholic high school, a new performance center at the boys local high school, uh, preparing to open up an Olympic size pool uh, down the street. This is all within a few miles of each other. Um, and then the high school working with LAUSD is preparing to upgrade uh, the football field, the track, etc. So the, the bones, the infrastructure is there. The city is prepared to, to provide the infrastructure, uh, Rex and Parks uh, has great infrastructure. What we need is the programming. Uh, we have, uh, this exists, these are new facilities, uh, so I'm happy to say they have great new restrooms, uh, great new infrastructure, uh, accessibility, they're organic, they're popular, uh, but we really need to, to fast forward uh, dispersing the, the resources so that we can get the programming. There's incredible excitement, at least in my district, in my community, this is what I hear, uh, about this type of engagement, this type of interaction. Uh, people are really, really excited for us, for example, to open the Olympic pole, to bring uh, Olympic champions uh, to the opening and to get that training, get that coaching as we prepare to move forward. So I just want to encourage you to, to know that we are prepared to partner with you, that we look forward to doing this and for the first time to do this uh, at the front end and not wait until the games are done. Thank you. We couldn't be more excited. Okay. Uh, before I uh, ask uh, Mr. Krikorian to ask a question, you mentioned when you were engaged with Mr. Price, uh, media rights, sponsorship rights. I think this is a good opportunity to kind of explain that just a little bit and how that's going to uh, be a great assistance uh, to us. So could you expand on that, expand on that a little bit? Right. So NBC, when they acquire the media rights from the International Olympic Committee, um, uh, the IOC sells those on a territory by territory basis, and NBC owns those rights in the United States through 2032, uh, which merely gives them the rights to broadcast the games and to sell commercial inventory in and around uh, the delivery of those games. Our rights, uh, in partnership with the U.S. Olympic Committee, are around sponsorship rights for both Team USA, the U.S. Olympic team, and the U.S. Paralympic team, as well as LA28. Uh, and what we have done through our agreement with NBC is NBC has made a significant financial investment uh, against those commercial rights, as, if you will, against the budget we have um, um, that will allow us to go to the market and deliver to advertisers for the first time uh, the consistency over this following nine-year period across these games of both sponsorship and media. And just like any investment, um, the person taking the investment monetizes their assets, de-risks their opportunity, and shares in the upside with their investor. And that's exactly the kind of arrangement we have made with NBC. And I think it should give uh, everyone great confidence that the numbers we have, which were all done, this is a deal that closed after our KPMG process was done, um, um, are are quite solid and deliverable. 
Okay, this is unique though. It has never been done in the history of the Olympics and uh, uh, the power of the Olympics coming back to the United States for the first time since 2002 and to have a, a partner in NBC who has obviously a deep belief, both financial and operational and philosophical commitment to the Olympic Games, uh, this and the changing media landscape, all of those things coming together created a really unique opportunity for us. Yeah, and what it does, it gives us a tool that the other cities in the past have not had, even the games that are coming up now. This is not, this is unique to us and I think a testament to our creativity. And so it's important that the people understand this and I think it's important that the, the media understand, you know, the, this, this creative approach and the possibility of benefits for uh, the, the city and the committee. With that said, Mr. Krikorian. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, just a couple of things to follow up on my colleagues' comments. First, to put a little bit finer point on the important message that Mr. Cedillo left us with. Um, we have a Department of Recreation and Parks that is still decimated yes. after the recession, um, that still is struggling to uh, perform the basic services that we expect of it because of the impact that the recession had on its budget. To the point that in the not too uh, distant past, there have been times when um, recreational parks turned down donations of land, gifts of land, because they couldn't accept that free land because they couldn't afford to maintain it. And so the um, idea of having revenue come in from this games in advance of the games happening so that poor kids throughout this city can participate in sports. Um, anybody who belittles that or thinks that that is not critically important to changing lives in this city is kind of missing a big part of the point of where this city is right now. Um, so thank you for raising that point, Mr. Cedillo. Um, and I think Mr. Price also raised the really important point about small business participation in this. And um, I think you know Mr. Wasserman and Mr. Price and his committee and my ad hoc committee have been working on, and will be working further this summer when we get a report back on this, on developing a procurement platform that will embrace the city's procurement, Metro, the county, the organizing committee in one place so that people who, small businesses that want to engage in this process of economic development, of jobs creation, of, of stimulating new businesses here in Los Angeles for the benefit of you know, real people who are really working here in Los Angeles uh, will be able to benefit from some of this infusion of activity. Uh, not just from the organizing committee's activity, but all of the other city processes and county processes and metro processes and all the other things. Just as happened in the London Games um, when the London uh, Olympics was able to, to spin off tremendous amount of procurement by even quite small businesses that were able to participate in the games. We want to emulate that here, and I'm confident that with the work that we're doing, creating this uh, procurement platform, this will be um, a games in which businesses of all sizes uh, throughout the city of Los Angeles with all sorts of employees will be able to, to benefit from. Mr. Price. Thank, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I just want to co-sign uh, comments made by uh, my colleague uh, Gil Cedillo, Cedillo on the importance of parks, especially uh, in underserved areas uh, like ours. <clears throat> Mine is uh, severely underparked, and so we have uh, um, embarked upon a, a campaign to clean up and to fix up as many as possible. New soccer fields, new play areas, new walk paths, exercise areas, pools, almost $40 million over the course of uh, the past six or seven years. But the real problem has been services. And so again, that's why it's going to be exciting to um, bring this program to the parks in a way that leverages the investments that we've already made and that we're making, uh, and doing it in a way that we're investing with families and kids. And so um, we're excited to see that moving forward. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. O'Fair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just want to uh, lend a voice as the immediate past chair of Arts Parks River um, and entertainment is that for years since we uh, 
agreed to hosting the 2028 Olympics, um, the organizing committee has come to that committee along with several reports from Recreation and Parks. And I just want to say that um, from where I sit, your partnership with Mike Scholl and the senior management at Rec and Parks has improved um, their ability to collect accurate data about where the greatest needs are. The fact that we know exactly where the park facilities are, that we're, where we're going to focus, uh, and the fact that the process that has been agreed upon for this youth sports uh, initiative um, will also focus in on some of the, the more well-off districts and neighborhoods where we have pockets of poverty. So the, the data collection ability has improved vastly just through recreation of parks, the entire system. So as a result of this partnership, recreation and parks has actually improved their entire system for serving our youth better than ever before. And, and I think that this partnership and these resources will only enhance that. One of the things that I've said is that I want the legacy of the 2028 Olympics to live on far beyond the two and a half weeks of the games being held here themselves. And part of that successful legacy will be to have left our neighborhoods better off than before. Some of the facilities that have been recently built that are going to be improved, and there is there's this massive um, improvement of all the existing facilities going on. Some facilities will be replaced entirely, uh, like in Hollywood, for example, not because of this partnership, but just because of uh, previous funding efforts. Um, we may very well create Olympians from Los Angeles because of this, but that's not the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal is to uh, enrich the lives of families, some families in some of these impacted neighborhoods, these traditionally overlooked, underserved neighborhoods, have to make a Sophie's choice with choosing one of their child, one of their children, to a sports program. Well, because of this partnership, we'll be able to send all of their kids to our recreation facilities. And we can accommodate many, many more. And lastly, let me just say this, because it, it can't be said enough. The fact that you doubled, maybe you even, maybe you even tripled your participation in the swim sports uh, in Los Angeles because of the program that was launched last year is already an enormous success. Yes, providing the ability for kids who would never otherwise learn to swim at a young age, which is a quality of life issue, maybe even a life and death issue no, it is. in our inner city, are now able to swim and they're enjoying the pleasures of swimming. That in and of itself is already an enormous victory. So I just got to be out there as the former immediate past chair of the committee that has seen the results and uh, I have to celebrate that relationship because the city is already better off because of this relationship and I can only imagine what's possible in the next nine years and beyond to set us on a permanent course um, of that being part of the culture of health and fitness in Los Angeles. And as you know, I'm really big on health and fitness. So thank you for that. Thank you. Okay. There are no more questions. Uh, members, there'll be no action today. We'll hold this in committee for 30 days, and we'll see you guys in a month and move this along. Right. So uh, thank you very thank you. much. Uh, any more uh, business before this committee? No, sir. Okay, this committee is adjourned.